John Maxwell's father, Melvin, said he lived in a community where there were two successful people, and he said there was something about them that separated them from everyone else in the community. The thing that separated them was this. They saw possibilities when other people did not. And the second thing, they pursued those possibilities. I don't know about you. I don't know what happens in your life and how you view situations and circumstances that are happening all around you. But you have a choice as to how you're going to embrace those things in your mind. You're going to say God can do all things or through God, probably I'm not going to get much done anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Larry Walters lived in Los Angeles near the LAX airport, and he had a vision and a dream that he would be able to, to go up into the air just a little ways. He had no pilot license. He wanted to go up into the air a little ways, so he bought about 40 helium weather balloons, BB gun, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you got to have that. Lawn chair, tied those balloons on to that lawn chair. He intended to go up about 2,000 feet, and he start shooting those balloons out. He got going in the air. He definitely went 2,000 feet. He just wanted to see around a little bit and see from a different perspective, but it didn't stop there. He was at 4,000. Pretty soon, he was at 10,000 feet. My goodness, he caught the attention of the police. He caught the attention of, of the uh, airport. He caught the attention of everybody around wondering what in the world is going on. 12,000 feet he began to descend. And finally, as he's making his descent, he's coming down and his balloons get hung up on the wires. He's low enough to the ground because the chair is extended below the balloons and he could just hop out of his chair onto the ground. They asked him later, a reporter did, microphone in the face, why did you do it? You know what he said? Well, you can't just sit around. <laughs> oh my goodness. Life throws all kinds of situations at us. Victor Frankel was incarcerated. He was a Jewish psychiatrist. And he was in the concentration camp. Many people around were dying. On this particular day, they stripped everyone down of everything they had had on previously in the concentration camp, and they exchanged that for old garments from people that had already gone to the gas chambers. And he put on a garment, reached into the pocket, knowing he was wearing a very garment someone else had worn just before they went in the gas chamber. It would give you the willies. But he reached in and there he pulled out a Bible passage. It was an inspiration to his heart. And later he would write in Man's Search for Meaning these words. There is nothing in the world that would so efficiently help one to survive, even the worst of conditions, as the knowledge that there is meaning in one's life. Here's what he says. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Think of that. It's pretty riveting. The Apostle Paul was not always known as the Apostle. He wasn't even always known as Paul. He persecuted Christians, though he had a pedigree that was quite impressive. Education from the best and heritage that seemed to be very rich. He still hated Christians, and one day, in a vision, God arrested him. Dreams happen to people still today. A lot of times we hear about this in Muslim culture and other cultures, Mideast cultures, where they will have some kind of vision or dream that happened. He had this vision, and the revelation came to him that you don't want to live this way. You don't want to keep going this way. There is a better life for you. And he asked, who are you, Lord? You know, I studied that out a bit, and it doesn't say, who are you, Jesus Christ? He's not saying that. He says, who are you, Lord? Who are you, superior one? I know you're more than me. And then the message comes to him, it's hard for you to kick against these goads to keep going the way you are. The claims are so impressive for Christ that when you pause to consider them with your whole heart, with your whole mind, you cannot help but be impressed and even changed. 
So when you enter into our passage today in Philippians chapter 4, and you read through the passage that Pastor Alana read just a little bit ago, you come down into verse 10, and then you move into verse 11, and you read a small phrase you don't want to pass it by quickly. I have learned. That means he's growing. That means he's developing. That means he doesn't know it all ahead of this, and he wouldn't claim to know it all because he continues in his learning. And look at verse 12 of your passage there. He says again, I have learned. I want to stop just for a minute for station identification. Nudge your neighbor and say, we're going to ID for a moment. Here we go. As we ID at station identification, here's what we're going to consider just for a second. I want to ask you a question by way of introduction. From whom are you learning? What is your teacher? Who is your professor? What is your textbook? What are you learning in this season of your life? He already had his formal education out of the way. His higher learning, his credentialing was impeccable. Nah, he wasn't getting that, was he? He was getting the lessons that were being taught to him by those who were in his life like Ananias, the apostles that came around like Peter, people like Priscilla and Aquila and other people like this who would influence and instruct him and spend time teaching him the way of God. And he began to understand fully the claims of Christ. And he began to understand what happened at Pentecost through the Holy Spirit. And he began to understand the significance of leaning on Christ. And as he does this, he said, I have learned some. What are you learning during this COVID season? What are you learning during this pandemic? What are you learning during this season of interruption of life? What are you learning that is taking you beyond where you've been before? I've been on a number of Zoom calls with pastors Yesterday, I was on one with a group of leaders, and, and then uh, with 70-plus pastors earlier this week, we were in a Zoom call, and I'm amazed at the number of them that have said that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have really spoken out to them, because that's exactly where the Holy Spirit has drawn my reading during this COVID season, is back to the Gospel, is back to the simple message of Jesus Christ. It's powerful. What God can do, who He is, what He is about, what have you learned in your life that is teaching you now, that is sustaining you now, that is holding you up right now? What is it that God has shown you that you know for sure can be validated in the Scriptures? It is congruent with God's Word. It is not just some kind of whim that you have. No, it is something that is real, and you have test-driven it. Paul has test-driven this stuff. He says, I'm in prison and he says, I've had a lot, and I haven't had very much, but I have learned something. Well, I want to learn from him, don't you? I want to hear what he's got to say here. He would say, follow me as I follow Christ, so here we go. Let's follow him for a few steps and see what he has to say to us. I think he has something that might be good. Look at verse 13 of your passage. Philippians chapter 4 is so good. It's one of the early verses I learned. I didn't know how many times I would need it through my life. But as I move into this chapter of my life, oh my stars, I've lived off this verse many days of my life because there have been many different seasons when I have had to lean on him in unusual ways. Look what he says. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Wow, we isn't that powerful? He's very grateful for the goods they have given to him because they are encouraging him, they're inspiring him, they're uplifting him, they're bringing him, uh, you know, the encouragement that he would need, and things like that can bring us comfort, right? So we applaud that. But he says the inner strength, the inner peace, the inner awareness that God is with me is that which can sustain someone like Frankel when they are in the most dire of circumstances. Are you in the dire of circumstances today? If you are, you can find the strength of Christ to be your sustaining force. He is with us. He is with us in the good times. He's with us in the bad times. He's with us all the time. And when you find that out, when you face the challenges that come to you, you begin to understand, I too can join with Paul and I can say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I feel this message today. I live this message Man, oh me, this is good stuff. This is rich stuff from the Word of God, and you can test drive it, and it'll work. We had announced our opening of this building, and we were so excited, and people flew in from several states and were coming from all around, and then we were told we could not open this building unless we wanted to jeopardize drawing unwanted press to our place and perhaps legal action. 
I remember sitting in that lobby out there with everything ready for church, we believe. And Ken Everett and I were sitting there and we were debating, do we open or do we close? And we said, no, we won't open. Friends still had their tickets bought. They still were already coming. I had to stand up and tell you we're not going to be able to open. And I prayed out there. And there was Brittany Dieter working in the cafe at the time. And she saw our angst and may have overheard us. I have no clue. But she brought over drinks for us. They weren't stiff. (laughs) She brought over some drinks for Ken and for me. She had made some strawberry smoothie things. And and we, we sat there and I prayed this, God, don't let me strike the rock. You know what that's talking about, Moses, when he got anger, struck the rock? I said, don't let me strike the rock because the name of Jesus is the one we want to lift after we move in here. It's the one we go in now. Would you allow us to have that? While raising children, I have found that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. While being married, I have found I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Last night, a bunch of young adults were at my house, and while they were there, a couple getting married in just 42 days were there. And so I I talked to them just for a little bit, just chit-chatting friendly ways, and I I explained to them some things. Basically, I was paraphrasing my message to them. (laughs) They didn't even need to come to church today. They got last night, but... You can make it through God. So let's ask a couple of questions this passage. If you're ready to ask them, please say yes. yes. Let's do it. These, these questions, I believe, when answered, will help us understand what it is to live a confident life in Christ. First question that we ask, who can use the power of Christ? Paul says, I can do all things. Who is Paul? Well, he has a past that he'd like to forget, and he's asked forgiveness for You may have a past that you would like to forget, but all of us have a past we must ask Christ for forgiveness for. I have asked, you have asked, and through Christ, he forgives us. He says, anyone who comes to him, he will not turn us away. Paul was an ordinary person like the rest of us. He had to eat. He needed glasses. Tradition tells us he was pretty short, didn't have a lot of hair, had bad vision, but he's a wonderful and prolific guy and wrote much of the New Testament. He says, I can do all things. I can means God is bringing me into the story in some unusual place. I can says God wants me in the story. Let's say it together. God wants me in the story. Say it out loud. God wants me in the story. And for those of you watching at home and those of you in other venues, I hope to hear you as well. God wants us in the story. Don't belittle yourself. Don't negate your influence through him. But know that you are an important ingredient in the fabric of life, and he wants you. And he says, I can do all things through Christ. It also means that some things are not yet done that need to be done. It also means that some things that appear today to be impossible are quite possible, not by myself, but with God. That's when all things become possible. Isn't that awesome? We don't have to worry about all of the heavy lifting. And you know something else? We don't have to take all the credit for it or all the blame for it. Robert Kennedy said it this way. Some men, (laughs) I can't quite talk like him, but anyway. Some men see things as they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. Paul had a healthy view of himself, and he had a healthy view of God. A healthy self-view and a healthy view of God puts us in a dynamic situation. Harriet Tubman had fled from the south to the north in finding freedom. She said, I want this for others. She made 19 trips to the south, free over 300 of her friends, and said this later, it became more treacherous each time I went. But God was with me. Who's with you? Who's with you today? Who's with you at the office? Who's with you at the schoolroom? Who is with you when you're driving around in your cruiser? Who is with you whenever you're at the clinic? Who's with you? Let him be with you. 
He is with them. You can face death. You can face challenges with the job. You can face everything. The new chapter of your life and the new frontier of an opportunity that is fantastic. You can face it through Christ. You can do all things. Well, there's a second question I want to ask. If you're ready to receive, please say yes. All right, let's keep cruising. Here it is. Where does this power come from? Where does this power come from? Well, we know when our phones die, we have to plug them into the wall. It comes from the wall. <laughs> no, it comes from a power source somewhere down the street, doesn't it? We know that. Uh, we get a little bit hungry, and after a while, you've got to go somewhere for brunch, right? McDonald drive through. Here we come. No, <laughs> we'll shoot for a little higher maybe. But uh, you see what I'm saying? We, we've got to be recharged, renewed. I mean, you slept, so you might be renewed to be able to be here today. Well, he's talking about something else. He's talking about we have some heavy lifting. When we have that I, I can't opportunity in front of us, and we're trying to turn it into the I can because God has called us to experience it. How are we going to do it? We know what 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, greater is the one that is in you than the one that is in the world. The one in the world brings doubt, brings fear, brings intimidation, brings you're not going to do it. But the one that is in you says, I have called you to it. I will see you through it. I will provide for you. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Can I get a witness in the house even at 9 o'clock? <laughs> Man, that's good preaching. Keep going, Kev. Okay, I will. Got to talk to myself sometime. So what about this source? Where does this power come from? Where's this power coming from? Well, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the source of this power. Let's say Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. It's great to say his name, isn't it? Great to call on his name. Name above every name, the scripture says. The name at which the scripture says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is who? Lord. Man, he is the source of our power. It is him working in us. When I was a kid, we used to sing a song, there are no boundaries, no limit to what God can do, to what he can do through me and through you, if we'll trust and believe that his promise is true. But listen to this, it's according to the power that's at work in you. What power is at work in you? <laughs> what power is in you today? I don't know what power is in you. Paul had intellectual power, but he said, that's not the power I'm drawing from. Paul had all kinds of credentialing. He said, that's not all I'm drawing from. He's writing of much of the New Testament. That was not the power he was drawing. He says, I've been all kinds of places. I've been everywhere, man. And he said, I planted all kinds of churches, but he wasn't boasting of that. He's boasting in Christ. Who are you boasting in? What are you boasting in? We boast in something. When I went for ministry training, it seemed like the school was quite dead. And it bothered me. And it bothered several other students. I didn't become a rebel, but I voiced my opinion to a few people that were friends. And they said, no, student body seems kind of apathetic. And the teachers don't seem excited. And we're here to study about God. And it's like, what can we do about this? My stars, we ought to be able to do something. So we realized the chapel was unlocked. And so we began to go over to the chapel many nights. And we prayed. I remember laying down on the floor just praying. And we would kneel down, and some would walk around, and we were just seeking God. When you get desperate, you seek God. When, when you put off trying to be prim and proper and trying to impress everybody, you seek God. It can get kind of ugly. It's kind of like ugly crying, you know. You kind of just get desperate, right? You're not trying to impress anybody. You're trying to call all God. And you're trying to receive from God that something that is happening will change, that something that should be will come into existence that has not yet come into being. And we went over there and prayed that God would change that place and that he would wake us up, that he would forgive us for anything we were needing forgiveness, that he would show us what we need. And then he would cause a hunger and a thirst among the student body and that the teachers would wake up and they would feel the blessing of God and they would feel something of God working that they might have the excitement again that God was at work in their life and the truths they were teaching us were real and deep and incredible. Oh, we all believed it, but we were just kind of apathetic. That summer I went home and I was ready to give it up. And I've, I don't think I've ever shared this story before. Probably my whole ministry. Until this weekend. And I went home and I was ready to go and 
talking to Pam about it this week. I was ready to pursue a a couple of different schools that I had heard about and had interest in. And my brother said, no, I think you ought to keep going there. And I prayed about it, and it was close enough to home. And I prayed, and I said, okay, God, we'll see what you do based on the prayers we prayed. We went back to school. And there was a little bit of a change in the atmosphere starting to happen. I ran for student body president. One of the other guys that had been a key prayer person, he, he ran for vice president, and somebody else ran for secretary treasurer of the student body. And we thought, you know what, we're going to see this happen. I remember in chapel service one day, some of us had already put our names in the hat, and one of the uh, speakers of the chapel said, some of you more politically minded people ought to put your name in. In other words, we don't have very satisfactory candidates at this point. And I sat there thinking, good grief. But I didn't take my name out because I had already put my name in. And I just say, well, I'll let the people decide. And I'm not really politically motivated, but in this moment, I decided I was going for it. No turning back now. I left my name in there. And over the next two years, we saw the place turned upside down for God. The administrator that had stood on the platform and asked for more politically minded people came to me one day in a private conversation at the steps of the chapel and said to me, you have made more difference in this place than anybody I know. It wasn't me. It was all of us praying and it was me being willing to be the spokesman but saying, Lord, you have your way freely in my spirit to do anything you want to do. People may not understand, people may not applaud, people may not get all excited, but you can and you will. And it was wonderful to see God work in a spiritual uplift and updraft in that place. It is a presence of God. We have many people that have come into this church and say, what is it? When they leave, they say, there is something different. I've never experienced that when I've gone into a church. What is it? I said to you early on, there is the... The throttle of God, I used to tell you in the other sanctuary, the throttle of God, don't anybody touch it. He determines our speed and our direction, our force, our velocity. It's all up to him. Don't t- I won't touch it. You don't touch it. That's not ours to touch. That's his. And we have walked in cadence with him. And when some of us have tried to reach out and touch it, we have messed up the chemistry of God's working among the church. But when we pull our hands back, God is honored. Campuses are started. Buildings are built. Many will come to faith in Jesus Christ. And we have seen literally hundreds of people come to faith in Christ. It has been an amazing run, even among Dutch country. It's amazing what he can do. It's him. It's the power of Christ in us. To some of you, this may be brand new. To some of you, you may be looking at this and saying, sheesh, consider it. I want to say something else to you, alluded to it, but I say it to you significantly, intentionally, and on purpose. There is power in the word of Jesus Christ. There is power in the word of God. This is why I hate it that they've taken the Ten Commandments down. So many public places. We need God. We came from him. In him we live and move and have our being. And it's to him we will return someday. Don't forget it. Ellen had an appointment this week. Priscilla's father had an appointment last week. I don't know when my appointment is, but I've got one, and so do you. You have an expiration date on your heart, and it will stop when your days are done. You will be gone, and where will you? This is the living word of God. Can I get a witness in this house today? It is not a book among many books. It is the book among all books. Not just because it's a top seller, but because it is God's inspired word. And it stands tall. And it will guide us through any situation that life will bring us. And I don't want to just be alone up here on this stage saying this to you, but if that's what I would have to do, that's what I do. I want to tell you what, when I have to place my life and my future on anything, I will put it on the word of God. He has never failed a landing, and he won't now. Heaven and earth, he said, may pass away. As a matter of fact, he tells us it will pass away. But he says, my word will never pass away. That is incredible. You can bet the ranch, (laughs) anything else, on the word of God because it is going to come to pass. It is amazing. And his word tells us how to live our life. There is also power in the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to say to you today in all kindness, 
as nice and as good as any of us may be or any of you watching today may, may be, and I'm sure there are many great people watching and listening right here and in other venues, I'm sure. But let me say this to you in all kindness. Christ didn't die because we didn't need a Savior. He died because we did need a Savior. And his blood that was shed on the cross was shed for you, sir, for you, ma'am, for me, for all of the children, all the teens, and all the adults. Red and yellow, black, brown, and white. We're all precious in his sight. And the ground is level at the foot of the cross for everyone who will call on the name of the Lord. Your Bible says, your Bible says, Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, will find the forgiveness of sin. This is absolutely powerful because it takes anyone in who will call on his name. Can I get a witness somewhere in the house? My stars, that's good stuff. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Andre Crouch, excellent songwriter, Christian songwriter, he wrote this. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. And this will sound a little bit old school to say... I'm okay with that. When I was a kid, they taught me because I watched them in the older saints. They would pray, and when they did not know exactly how to pray, but they were in deep consternation of prayer and burden was heavy and breaking them, they would say, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. He is my defense. He is my sole purpose for living. He's my everything. He's my answer to your dilemma cannot go in a higher name than that. It puts demons to flight. Evil forces are broken. And the song we sang a little bit ago about him breaking chains, I have watched him do it. I had a young man come to me one day in another place, and he came to me and he said, I am trying to get off of these addictions that I have. And he says, and you know what I did? He said, I went to God and I said, look, I hear you can break, help break addictions. I can't break this. I can't get free from this. But if you'll help me, I'll, I'll work on it myself. I'll do my part. And said, if you'll do it, God, here I am. And said that God broke him free, got an accountability partner, and he was free from the addiction that he had. That's a Jesus that I'm talking about today. There is, there is power in the blood. There's also power in the name of Jesus. He says in John chapter 14, whatever you ask in my name, I will do. That is according to his will, he will do it. Acts chapter 3 and verse 6, Peter says, we don't have silver and gold to give you, but in the name of Jesus, we give you his name. He gave the name. When David went up before Goliath, he says, I'm not all that in a box of crackers or something similar to that. He said, I'm not, all, but he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Whose name do you go in? When you go into the interview, are you going in with your name or, or his name? Go in with the name of Christ before you. There is power in the name of Jesus. Now there's our part. Look what he said. I can do. If you sit there and you don't do anything, God's not just going to throw the sling for you. He's not just going to go through the interview for you. It says, I can do. When my friend was getting free from the addictions, it was, I can do. He did his part. And that's what the scripture calls us to. God uses humankind, doesn't he? Adam and Eve to populate the planet. Noah to continue the race. Mary to carry the gospel for nine months in her womb. Jesus took on the form of humanity. We see that God uses human beings. There's our part. But there's also God's part. And that's the coming together. Look what the scripture said. He strengthens us. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's going to be the Holy Spirit coming in you. And that is the power that, that Paul was drawing from in these moments. The residual enough power of God. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you let him have his right away? It was a batter came up to bat in the ninth inning. Yogi Berra was there and it was a tight game. And the batter reached down to the plate and with his bat drew the cross Bearer was a catcher for the Yanks, and he dusted that off, and he said, let's let God watch this one. Well, that's a witticism that is really cool. He seemed to score a cha-ching, but actually that's poor theology. Very poor. We try to live our lives and say, God, you just watch this one. I'll call you if I need you. And as Pastor Melanie prayed in a prayer, forgive us where we have put you aside. Fits right here. We don't want to put him aside. He is the centerpiece of our existence. I can do all things, listen to this, that are within your will that you call me to do because you will strengthen me to do it. Not easy things. No, he's incarcerated. 
So I say to you, God plus you makes a majority. Christopher Ewan stood on this platform just a handful of years back, and he told his story of living a very, very out-of-bounds life. He'd gotten involved in drugs. He had walked far, far from any connection to God. And he involved himself in very promiscuous living, doing all kinds of sexual things and, and dealing drugs. And finally, a knock at his door and German shepherds and the cops there, they said, we are here to arrest you. And they put him in prison. He had a praying mother and father who back home were praying for him. Some friends back at a church were praying for him. But now he's incarcerated. He doesn't really believe in God, doesn't think there is a God, doesn't think God cares about him anyway. He sees a verse or two on the walls that have been scrawled there from previous prisoners, and he looked at those and he says, wow, crazy talk. Eventually he would get a Bible and he would begin to read it and say, well, you know what, I guess I'll give it a shot. And as he began to read and open his heart and open his mind to the Scriptures, God began to answer questions that were big questions. Why am I here? Where, where am I going? Who's done anything about it? What do I need to do about it? Is there a better way? What is the way? And he's asking these big life questions. Have you been asking those? He asked them. And as he continued his journey through the Scriptures and continued to think about it, he eventually realized Jesus Christ is God's Son. Jesus Christ did die. Jesus Christ did come back to life. Jesus Christ is the answer for the dilemma of our sin, the question that keeps us from God. He is the path. He's the bridge. And he said there in that prison, I opened my life to God. And he began to study and began to prepare for ministry. Not sure he really ever would need that or, when he, or how it would ever be used. But eventually through the breaks that came to him, God made a way and released him from prison. Not in a breakout, but in a legal exiting way. <laughs> and he left there. And he be became a professor at Moody Bible Institute. And he has traveled all over the world sharing the good news that no matter the life you have lived, there's a God in heaven who still exists. And he is not diminished in his invitation to whoever will call on him. And he calls out to you. And many have found him to be very engaging in his testimony and his witness to be very good. I encourage you to pray for him. He's very sick right now. But pray for him that God might be with him and give to him strength in his body and strength in his mind and that God might help his message to continue to go out. And you can go on YouTube, Google it, whatever, and watch his story. It's very fascinating. And as his parents shared their faith that God could do something, it was absolutely amazing to see how God responded in that situation and then how Christopher responded and victory became his. What is God calling you to today? What is God wanting you to do? What is it he has in mind for you during this season, this chapter, this moment of your life? I don't know. Some things seem illogical, ill-fated, ill-timed. But when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, we surrender, don't we? And in that surrender, we say, God, have your way and lead me in the plain path. And you know what? He has a way of bringing things together that weren't together before. And he leads us in the way that we should go.